to the Black Barrister Network event, applying to become a judicial assistant, Q&A with the Supreme Court. My name is Olamide Ogrenade. I'm a barrister at Amethyst Chambers and a committee member on the Black Barristers Network. The Black Barristers Network was founded in 2019 with the objective of promoting the growth of Black Barristers through visibility, support and community outreach. Further information about the work we do can be found on our website, the link to which will be provided for you in the chat box. We are grateful to Chris Mell, the head of HR at the Supreme Court for approaching us in respect of today's event. And I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Abimbola Johnson, barrister at 25 Bedford Road and also a committee member who has worked behind the scenes to put the event together. In terms of tonight's structure, Chris is going to provide us with an overview of the role of a judicial assistant. And then we are fortunate to have with us three judicial assistants, Gretel Scott, Oliver Jackson and Alessandra Fozzani. They are going to provide us with insight into their experiences as a judicial assistant. Once they're finished with their presentation, you, the floor will open to you to be able to put your questions to them. We'd ask that you put your questions in the question and answer box, which you can find at the bottom of the screen. Please don't put them in the chat box. And we'd also ask that your questions relate only to the role of a judicial assistant and don't embark on, on questions in respect of the cases at the Supreme Court. I'd also like to let you know that this event is being recorded. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Olamidi. Um, and thank you everyone for, for giving up your time tonight to attend um, this event um, and to Varuna, who's working behind the scenes at, at making sure that our, our Zoom is successful. Um, this is the um, well, a virtual first time we've done a virtual Supreme Court Black Barristers Network event. Um, we've done a few of these um, mainly in Scotland and, and other things. So we'll follow the same format. And um, so I'll give you a bit of an overview as to who I am and, and what we're doing. So to begin with, I'm, I'm the head of human resources at the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. Um, but I started off as a barrister's clerk um, many, many years ago um, in the temple. Um, firstly, at a fairly diverse set of chambers in King's Bench Walk. Um, and then I moved to Six Pump Court. Um, and then I decided um, at a, quite a young age that I needed to go off traveling the world and I quit my job and, and off I went. Um, and when I came back about a year later, I didn't know what to do, but I ended up falling into human resources. Um, and then eventually, probably because I was a barrister's clerk and because I worked with lawyers um, throughout my career, I ended up at the Supreme Court in 2011. Um, so it's now my 10th year supporting the recruitment of judicial assistants to work at the court. Um, I want to start by apologising for the, um, the length of my hair. I haven't had a haircut for about four months. And um, I don't want, I want to distract you with what's going on behind me. Behind me, I've got a, a fantastic um, graffiti art of uh, Gil Scott Heron. Um, and if you don't, don't look at my hair, look at Gil Scott Heron because uh, he's far more interesting than me. Um, and hopefully that tells you a little bit about me, um, the fact that Gil is, is there um, and is a real, a real hero of mine. Um, another hero is Lady Hale, and I'll mention her as our former president. Uh, she had an event this week about women in the law, um, and it was, it was fantastic to see her and to be reminded of her motto, uh, which is equality in everything. Um, and she's such an ambassador. We were fortunate last week to announce that we've got a new female justice at the Supreme Court, um, Lady Justice Rose, um, and she'll be joining us in April. And uh, that's fantastic, um, but there's no getting away from the fact that we have significantly more men uh, than women in our 12 justices, um, and they certainly don't reflect the society that we live in. Um, and I'll apologize for that head on because um, it, it isn't right, um, though the reasons are not straightforward. Um, and in fairness to me, it's actually an independent 
Cabinet Commission that make the appointments, and it's a very lengthy process um, that requires sign off from the Lord Chancellor, number 10 and the Queen. Um, but we have an ambitious program to try our very best to get more applicants coming through and to widen that, that group. So I think we will get there. Um, and I think one day soon we will see a black justice appointed. Um, and I know that there's a real commitment to make sure that there is greater diversity at, at the top of, um, of the court. Um, I'll mention one other justice as well, who was a very forward thinking man who fiercely stood for equal opportunities and that was Lord Kerr. Um, and Lord Kerr worked with me um, on pretty much every, every judicial recruitment campaign. Um, he retired last year and then sadly passed away in December. And um, so he's greatly missed by me personally, by everyone across the court. Um, but I kind of feel like the recruitment of JA is, is part of his legacy and something that he, he felt very passionately about. So I've, I've got a very clear duty to him and to everybody else to continue with that task. That's a bit of a preamble from me. Um, but I'm talking you, to you tonight about a wonderful opportunity for qualified lawyers to become judicial assistants. Um, when new J JAs join, we normally allow a few weeks to settle in and learn how to get around the building before the justices return from recess for the start of the legal year. However, the last two years have been a little different. The pandemic last year pushed all our, our cases to a remote setting on WebEx, and the year before, in September 2019, we had the prorogation of Parliament issue to resolve. And doesn't that seem quite a long time ago um, in all of our lives? I'm very lucky tonight because we've not only got one, but I've got three of our current judicial assistants with us, Oliver, Gretel and Alex. I'm very grateful for them for saying a few words. And they'll talk about why they applied and the importance of the JA role and their experience of the court in what is a very unusual year. First, I'll, I'll give a quick overview of the opportunity, um, because in case you're unaware, it's an opportunity for qualified lawyers to join the Supreme Court as JAs on fixed term contracts from September to July every year. Applications are via the Hayes recruitment site and you're required to complete an application form. The closing date this year is midnight on Monday the 31st of March and interviews will take place remotely um, in May with Lord Lloyd-Jones and Lord Sales on the panel. Successful candidates are usually invited to a drinks reception in early July, and this is candidates um, find out which justice they're going to actually be assigned to work with. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a real party, um, and it's an opportunity to meet with the current JAs as well. Optimistically, I hope that this will happen in July, um, even if we're still socially dis distanced. Um, we are making steps to open the court again and, and start to get ready. So I hope by July we'll be able to do that. The role of the JA is very varied. Uh, no two days are identical. You will face interesting legal issues, a challenging but stimulating workload, and be required to think on your feet. Competition and the caliber of those applying is always very high. You need to be a qualified lawyer in the UK and have at least a 2-1 degree. You also need to have finished your pupillage or training contract or be about to finish before the start of the legal term. So if you're a pupil now, that's fine. You can still apply, um, but as long as you're, you're going to be finished by October. The challenge every year for us is to find the very best legal minds across the UK to support the 12 justices. And we look for a mix of legal specialisms to try and avoid everyone having a background in commercial leasing um, or obscure shipping law or anything else. It's trying to find the right balance. We also look for diverse educational backgrounds, a good gender mix, a mix of solicitors and barristers. And not to forget, we want to find people that get on with each other and are very nice, considerate people. Um, and I think, as I say, this is my 10th year, and I think we've been very successful in, in doing that. Lord Kerr once very politely called me a sycophant, um, and of course I agreed with him completely. However, as a judicial assistant, the justice is quite likely to disagree with them, um, or at least have a difference of opinion to share on a case or a point of law. 
and that can be a little bit daunting to begin with when you're you're asked to give your opinion if it's different to, to what your justice is thinking but but perhaps the JAs can expand on that the year for a JA goes very very quickly and it's true to say from my observations that something of a transformation uh, takes place I'd like to think that working directly with the Supreme Court Justice and, and watching different legal teams come to present their cases will not hinder your long-term legal career. Just a very brief background to the court in case you haven't had a chance to visit before. Um, we're based in the Middlesex Guild Hall on the western side of Parliament Square. And we're a small non-ministerial government department independent from the Ministry of Justice or Her Majesty's Court Service. Um, there was a question that came in yesterday from somebody saying, how different is it to work for the Supreme Court um, instead of normal courts? Um, and uh, I, I'll answer it from my point of view, which is, I'd say it's very, very different. Um, one, because the size of our organisation, and um, two, because of the, the building that we're usually based in. Um, so it's really important to recognise we're not part of Her Majesty's Court Service, we're not part of the Ministry of Justice, um, we've only got a very small group of staff, it's around 50 staff and then the 12 justices, and then what makes us different is um, in usual circumstances we've got visitors coming in, we've got tourists, we've got educational groups, we've got international visitors, we've got a cafe, we've got our shop, we've got an exhibition area downstairs. So it's very different from a magistrate's court, very different from the Royal Courts of Justice. Um, and we, we're not linked to any, any ministers, which is for obvious reasons. Um, in normal times, in addition, we have the educational tours taking place. Um, as we've mentioned, well, we will mention, I'm sure, MOOC competitions, um, and all sorts of other events that take place throughout the year. And the JAs are very much encouraged to be part of the Supreme Court family while they're with us and join in with different events and activities. So we'd usually have quiz nights, lunchtime walks around St. James's Park, a book club, lunchtime yoga, um, and our infamous five-a-side football on a Friday uh, where various ex-JAs come back, both male and female, and they, they daunt me with their speed and skills, and I, I can't keep up, but I, I hope that we'll be able to get back to that um, later on uh, in the year. So I wasn't sure whether I should start answering the questions that were put forward yesterday now, but I think I'll hold that for the moment and let my colleagues speak. So thank you again for attending tonight and for listening. I hope you will be inspired to apply, um, or if it's not this year, if that isn't right for your career, consider applying in future years, because the opportunity is, is always there, and it is, it is truly a fantastic opportunity. But I will stop there and hand over to Oliver, one of our current JAs. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, thanks very much, Chris, for giving such a useful and helpful introduction. I'm going to talk about three main areas. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the application process specifically. I know there's lots of questions on that, but I'm going to leave that to Gretel and Alex. I'm going to talk about my route to the JA job and why I applied, uh, and then link that to my second area, which is going to be my experience in the job. What is it actually like working as a JA? And then third, I'm going to answer some of the questions that have already been put in the chat, because clearly that's what people want to hear about. And I hope I'm not going to talk for my full 10 minutes. So if there's any more questions, please keep them coming. Uh, that's what we're here for. As for my route to the JA job, I think it's really worth emphasizing that all JAs came here via a different route. There's no normal background for a JA other than, of course, being a qualified lawyer. So I, for one, started out doing a science degree. I then worked with the civil service for a bit, then spent three days as a management consultant, which was eventful. Uh, and then decided to do the law conversion course. I wanted to be a barrister, so I applied for pupillage. I uh, didn't get anything. So then I applied the next year and got one offer, did pupillage, didn't get tenancy. So, you know, there's a succession of knockbacks, but they keep coming. Uh, and now, uh, now I'm here in this role and I'm starting a third six in October. So I think, again, there's two points to emphasize from that. The first is that there is no normal route to becoming a judicial assistant. Some people do come here straight from pupillage. Some people have been barristers for a year or two before applying and getting the job. 
and some people have been solicitors for a while before starting a job. There is, really is a whole range of different stages of career that people come here for. Uh, the second point to emphasize is that it is perfectly normal in this area to apply multiple times. As Chris has said, competition is very fierce. Uh, like I just said, I didn't get pupillage first time around and applied again. Didn't get tenancy first time around and applying again. I know that one of the JAs who was on the court last year didn't get the JA role when he applied first time around. He was at a top uh, commercial barrister set of chambers and then applied again and got it uh, the next year. So perseverance and persistence can be very helpful in this area. Uh, as to what the job entails and why I applied for it, um, I'm not going to talk about the material that is already in the application paperwork, uh, things such as press summaries, for instance, which uh, is material you can find elsewhere. I think it's much more useful for you to hear from us about the more sort of the day to day running of what it actually is to be a JAA. And so in that sense, I think there's two main points. The first is the variety of the work. And this was the main reason I applied because someone explained this to me, a previous JA spoke to me about the sheer variety of the work. And I thought, that sounds fantastic. That's what I want to do. I don't want to be a specialist who only specializes in one area of law. I want to have a broad brush view of all of the law. And the Supreme Court is the perfect place to do that. It hears appeals on anything and everything. To, to try and sort of give concrete examples, in the last week alone, uh, Gretel and I have been working on a tax case. There's been extradition cases. There's been cases to do with economic torts of unlawful act arrest that are still rumbling on. And now today there was a hearing in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which is something that's going to be explained in more detail from Trinidad and Tobago. What does this mean, this variety? It means that you need to be able to read the papers fast, to pick up the basic principles of the area of the law you're working in, and then understand how those principles are applied in the authorities. There just isn't time to become a specialist, to become an expert, in the area of the law that you're going to be working in. You, it's instead the best way to look at it is that this is the single best way to get a big picture overview of the whole of the law in the UK and in other jurisdictions covered by the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. So the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council is the final court of appeal for lots of non-UK jurisdictions, such as one I mentioned just now, Trinidad and Tobago. There's also the Bahamas, Bermuda, Cayman Islands. Uh, generally jurisdictions that were at one point part of the British Empire and are now part of the Commonwealth, lots of them, not all of them of course, but lots of them still have the JCPC as their final court of appeal. And that means you get to see the most extraordinary variety of work. The case today was to do with the constitutional right to due process in, the, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. There are cases that come from lots of offshore tax havens to do with trusts. There's other constitutional cases um, some of the cases the Supreme Court's been working on recently are to do with same-sex marriage in some jurisdictions which have made the news. You get to see a whole variety of different work and that's one of the real appeals of it. My next favourite part of the job uh, is talking through the cases with the judge I work for. So this year there are 12 JAs, I think next year it's going down slightly, but this year there are 12 JAs for 12 judges. I work with Lord Burroughs how each judge uses their assistant can vary. Um, some judges like their assistants to write a note summarizing the, ar summarizing the arguments for both sides. In each case they hear. Some uh, judges will like a written note on what the assistant thinks should the, out the outcome of that case should be. Uh, Lord Burroughs sometimes asks for those sort of notes, but more often um, is more interested in just talking it through via a video call. Unfortunately, we're not in the building, so it's all being done remotely, but the judges are dealing with that quite well. And I still talk to Lord Burroughs probably two or three times a week uh, by video. Um, before the hearing, we have a chat. I explain what I think the outcome of the case should be. He tears that apart. He says what he thinks the outcome of the case should be. And I usually try and fail to tear that apart as well. Uh, it can be quite intimidating. There's no denying that, especially if it's an area of the law where I know nothing and he is one of the world experts say but you have to be able to defend your reasoning under pressure you have to be able to reason through the problems accurately and then be able to stand there and sort of take the probing criticism that will come your way and sort of be confident that what you've said 
hopefully makes sense. And if it doesn't, recognize that it doesn't make sense and move on. The point of this is so that the judges can use you to refine their reasoning. That's actually what they want. Of course, if you disagree, and I disagree with Burroughs sometimes, nine times out of 10, you're gonna be wrong and they're gonna be right, and that's fine. Where it really matters is sort of the one time in 10 where you point out something that is actually quite interesting and quite useful that they might not have thought of. Uh, thought of. And that is where you really add the value and can change their mind, and that can make a real difference. Uh, I'm going to now nearly stop talking and hand over to the next person. I'm not sure who it is, but I think it's worth briefly addressing one of the questions that I know has been asked in the Q&A, namely the differences between working for the Supreme Court and some of the other courts. Of course, there's the differences that Chris has mentioned, which are very real. I think there's two, three other main differences. The first is that in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, if you're applying to be a JA there, you don't have to be a qualified lawyer. You can, I believe, apply there before you've done pupillage, say. Whereas at the Supreme Court, you have to have completed pupillage or completed a training contract, as Chris has said. Second, in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, you only hear cases from the UK. I know that sounds obvious, but like I've just said, at the Supreme Court, you hear cases from all around the world via the uh, JCPC. And I would say a surprising number of cases. It always surprises people that 40 or 50% of the cases that the justices work on here are Privy Council cases. And you've got to be aware of that and sort of be familiar with dealing with legal principles such as written constitutions, for instance, that the UK simply doesn't have. Um, and the third difference, which I think is very prevalent and not often recognized, is that in the High Court, I have a few friends who are currently working in the High Court, and they say that a lot of what they deal with is the actual nuts and bolts of mitigation. If that's case management conferences, pre-trial reviews, applications for disclosure, preliminary issues, hearings, those sorts of matters that are actually the nuts and bolts of the junior end of the bar. So this, is what, this is what barristers do on a daily basis. And that's probably quite useful to practice if you're going to go into, if you're looking at going to the bar, say, whereas uh, here at the Supreme Court, we don't see any of that. You only deal with the really esoteric points of legal argument and principle that have been refined in the High Court and then usually refined in the Court of Appeal again and then make their way up to us. So I will freely admit, I actually have no idea how, sort of what the work of a junior barrister is, um, but you know, that's gonna be a challenge to deal with another time. Right, I'm going to stop talking and hand over to someone else now, thanks. Thanks Oliver, I'm next. Um, I hope like Oliver that I can use 10 minutes to persuade you to apply for the role because I've had an absolutely fantastic time and the only downside really is that it's going so quickly and it's only a year. So I was also going to briefly talk about uh, my route to becoming a judicial assistant and how it fits into my current career plan. Um, then three aspects of the role that I think are, uh, have been really beneficial and perhaps ones that aren't necessarily so obvious uh, when you read the advertisement material and then finally talk a bit about what it's been like to be working remotely and actually I see in the chat there are a couple of questions about skills whether skills that you should have for the JA role or skills that you learn so I'll try and cover that briefly at the end as well. So in terms of my route to the role I studied law and I did a master's in law and then I decided to qualify as a, as a solicitor at a, a large commercial law firm in London and I, I enjoyed that but it, I, I really missed the law so I, I worked then for two and a half years in the disputes and investigations team um, but as as barristers, you'll be aware as well, particularly probably commercial barristers, um, when you're actually practicing as a lawyer, you've got um, client expectations, lots and lots of emails, and generally not very much time to really keep on top of the law um, or indeed attend talks and things about legal areas that you're interested in. And so that was one of the main reasons that I really wanted to apply for this role because I, I really missed the law. And actually it fed into my plan that um, after this year, I'm switching to become a barrister and starting pupillage in October at a commercial chambers in London. And I, I hope that um, this time spent really immersing myself in the law again will be, will be really beneficial. And if not beneficial, then it's certainly been enjoyable. 
So in terms of um, the, the particular aspects of the role that I've really enjoyed, the first I would say, uh, like Oliver really, is learning to approach cases in, in different ways. So Oliver's talked about how you really learn from your justice. Uh, th the other aspect I would add to that is how you learn from each other. And referring back to the note that Oliver, me Oliver mentioned that we've been working on on a tax case, uh, by working together, you learn so much that I think you don't necessarily have um, as a barrister or as a solicitor in practice, because often in practice, I think you're working in quite vertical teams, whereas this is, is a horizontal, there are 12 judicial assistants all at the same level. Um, sorry, I should say 11 all at the same level and one head judicial assistant. But in terms of how we interact, we very much share ideas as if we're on the same level. And th that's really, be really beneficial to learn from each other. And we've tried to do uh, pre-hearing discussions um, a team's chat during a hearing and then post hearing discussions so that we really exchange our views on different cases. And obviously you also get to see how uh, other justices approach cases in different ways. For example, they might take more of a historical approach or a, a real focus on the purpose of a statute um, or a comparative law approach. And um, I, I, don't, I don't think you'd really ever see that other than from reading a judgment unless you're sort of on the inside. The second aspect I wanted to talk about was the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which Oliver is also, um, sorry, has also already mentioned. Um, and as he said, that's, that's the highest court of um, the Commonwealth countries and also, uh, sorry, for many Commonwealth countries, also the United Kingdom's overseas territories, crown dependencies and military sovereign base areas. Um, just to give an idea of numbers, and, and this information is in the Supreme Court's annual report, um, in 2019 to 2020, there were 81 Supreme Court appeals heard and, and 40 um, JCPC, so Judicial Committee of the Privy Council appeals heard. Um, but in terms of judgments delivered, there were a slightly more equal number. So there are a lot of JCPC cases and they're often overlooked. And I think also because they, they, they don't so regularly make the headlines. But I found these cases to be really quite eye-opening, um, both in terms of the variety of the kinds of topics that they throw up, but also in terms of learning from the different styles of advocacy often, um, which is understandable coming often again from quite different cultural backgrounds. Um, and so for, for example, um, I've seen some criminal cases, constitutional law cases, procedural cases and employment cases in the JCPC, which I think don't so often come before the Supreme Court. Um, two particular cases which are interesting in case you want to go off and look into them. Um, one you may you may well have heard about was uh, the Attorney General of the Turks and Caicos Islands and Missic, which was a case that was heard last November and judgment was handed down um, within a matter of a couple of weeks because it was urgent. And it, and it arose from coronavirus legislation that was passed in the Turks and Caicos Islands. And um, uh, the legislation enabled hearings to take place um, in their Supreme Court remotely. And in that case, the judge hearing in particular, a very high profile criminal trial, um, uh, lived in Jamaica and so the question was whether uh, that breached the constitution of the Turks and Caicos Islands for for him to be hearing a case in Jamaica um, because so so the, the claimants argued that meant that the court wasn't um, what was sitting outside its jurisdiction. Uh, another case of, of real interest and, and very different was this was just last month, this February, a case called Convoy Collateral and Broad Idea, which came from the British Virgin Islands. And this was a big commercial case and um, involved uh, freezing orders and whether they could be granted a, a against the person to freeze their assets, even when that person wasn't a party to any substantive proceedings, not just in the BVI, but anywhere across the world. Uh, so what's called a, a freestanding freezing order. Hopefully those two cases demonstrate the real breadth of the cases that come before the JCPC and um, 
I think these cases are really fascinating because they they throw up legal issues, like I said, that wouldn't often come before the Supreme Court. And th that really helps with like a sort of cross fertilization of different ideas. In terms of remote working, um, the uh, I, I've been working um, with Lord Briggs and he's been absolutely fantastic to work with um, remotely and I'm sure he would be in person too but we we speak uh, pretty much every day and um, we have video calls on teams and so I, I really haven't felt like it's um, been an issue that this year has been remote obviously it would have been even nicer if we'd been in a court building because the judicial assistants normally sit behind the judges so you really get uh, a great view of what's going on but um, if you're worried that there's a chance that there might be remote working in uh, in next year's role, um, uh, please, please don't let that worry put you off because it, it hasn't it hasn't detracted from my experience. Uh, so then, lastly, on the skills obtained um, and 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 skills that are useful, which is picking up uh, these questions in the Q and A. Um, I think one of the key skills is to be like a dog with a bone with research. Um, and to, to just be really keen about legal research. If, if you're not really interested in rolling up your sleeves and sort of looking on Westlaw and opening textbooks, then I don't think it's the right role for you. Um, but if you love doing that, or and even if you think you're not very good at it, but you'd really like to improve those skills, then, then definitely this is a good role for you. Um, and I should say as well, for those of you who maybe were slightly confused and didn't realise that um, you had to be qualified for this role, um, I, I, hope you're still, I hope you're still in the webinar because uh, I think these points that we're saying, well, some of these points that we're saying and certainly the skills probably apply across the board for judicial assistant roles in, in any of the courts. Um, another skill that I think is really useful to, to, to have, but also that gets honed, is clarity of thought and, and structure. And that's something that Oliver really made, made clear, actually, with you know, presenting your ideas to your judge, being prepared to then defend them. And uh, finally, I would emphasise uh, the importance of teamwork. So although you are working for, for your judge, um, or, or maybe next year for, for a number of judges, um, you are part of a team of judicial assistants and moreover you're part of a team that forms the Supreme Court staff and so you can't um, you know you you can't just just work for yourself um, and and the, the the staff at the Supreme Court are so great uh, I they're really inclusive and encourage you to get involved with different staff initiatives and I think that aspect of the role is, is really important and something that um, you should be aware of when applying you can't you can't just sit in your own little room with your door shut um, but hopefully that that that's a real selling point particularly for all of you who are barristers because um, it perhaps gives you a year when you get a bit more teamwork or a bit more um, uh, um, c communication or just a sort of day-to-day -day interaction with people than you might otherwise do um, in, in your in your day-to-day -day work. So those are the highlights of my experience and now I think it's uh, Alex's turn to persuade you all. Thank you Gretel. I'll, I'll try and do my best to appreciate that you've heard two uh, judicial assistants already. You've heard the best two um, already and so now you're stuck with me uh, at the end. I'm going to very briefly touch on my background, uh, which Ollie and Gretel have done, then look at why I did the role, what I understood the role to be at the time that I was applying, what I've enjoyed, uh, and what I have, I wouldn't say haven't, in, I wouldn't call it a sort of haven't enjoyed category, but things that are, aren't as I had expected them to be. And um, then hopefully take a, a few uh, questions uh, that are still in the chat. So I am currently the judicial assistant to Lord Leggett. He was appointed from the Court of Appeal in April last year. And so I am uh, the first uh, judicial assistant they were, he will have had uh, like Ollie and Lord Burroughs um, throughout his entire time um, sort of uh, for, for a year. My route into law uh, was uh, circuitous to say the least. I studied history, 
at Cambridge and did a master's in history uh, at Cambridge and then the GDL and the LPC. I worked for three years at an American law firm in the city of London and then for two years at a magic circle firm. So I am the uh, the upper end of the age bracket of the of the group. And my, my background was in financial services regulation, so financial services law, and really spent an inordinate amount of my time in private practice looking at Brexit and how UK law would change as a result of Brexit, assuming there was a deal, wasn't a deal, how equivalence works, uh, and also advising uh, various trade associations and, and government departments on what the law uh, was going to look like. So why, why did I do the role? What did I think the role would be when I almost 13 months ago thought about applying? I thought two things. Clearly, the Supreme Court is the highest court in the land, although it doesn't hear criminal appeals from Scotland, but for all, for, for all intents and purposes, it hears cases from a range of courts across the UK. And as Gretel and Ollie have both emphasised, it hears cases of constitutional, commercial importance and significance. And really, it's the only venue for those for those cases and the only uh, the only place uh, that hears cases of that calibre and quality. So that's one reason why I applied. Uh, the, the second reason was that I hoped, and one of these hopes has been satisfied, the other one yet to be satisfied, that I would hear two types of cases. Uh, the first type was a COVID-19 related case, and I, I will touch on that uh, a bit later in the sort of second theme that I've got. Uh, but I thought that I uh, would at least hear a case related in some way to COVID-19. The other case or type of case that I thought I'd hear was a Brexit case. And I'm afraid to my chagrin so far, I haven't had a Brexit case. Uh, I would settle one for half of the constitutional importance of the, the prorogation, but we just haven't had a Brexit case yet. It was touch and go with the internal markets bill, but we haven't had one yet. The, the, the role of the judicial assistant you know, predates the Supreme Court court, the, the House of Lords had what I think were called legislative assistance. And my understanding is Lord Hope um, was instrumental and Lord Bingham were, were instrumental in setting up the role. And it sort of mirrored uh, the legal clerk role that, that, that operated in the Scottish courts. And so th that, that was my, my understanding of the role, that, uh, and particularly the role at the Supreme Court, that I would be listening and hopefully engaging in cases of the highest constitutional importance and as I say these these two cases these two types of cases were my sort of motivating factors I'm really really, really interested in the law surrounding those particular areas I think one one final point to, to touch on on the sort of caseload the, the court's caseload and, and from even before the, the time it was the Supreme Court from when it was the House of Lords has become increasingly more uh, public law orientated. That's not to say it's exclusively dominated by public law, but from the sort of 1970s, where I think public and human rights law accounted for about 11% of cases, it's now at about half. The rest of the cases are fairly uh, sort of evenly divided, quite a significant proportion of high profile commercial cases, probably about 15% tax cases, employment cases, extradition and criminal criminal uh, law cases as well on the on the Supreme Court side. And then as Gretel has mentioned, there's a whole sort of gamut of extra stuff that you get to hear on the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council side. But I think an interest in public law uh, is something that if you have an interest in public law, it's something I think will definitely be satisfied at the Supreme Court. So what have what have I enjoyed? Uh, from 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 the experience, uh, I, I just the sort of the cases that are, the two cases I think that I'd like to, to touch on that that I've been involved in um, and sort of highlight aspects of the job that I've enjoyed. I was quite heavily involved with the FCA COVID nineteen business interruption test case that you may have heard of. So this is the case. Uh, the judgment came out in January and took up a lot of Christmas work for me. Uh, about whether policyholders could claim on their business interruption insurance um, because of uh, COVID-19. 
and and I think my role in that case really illustrates what you what you do. Um, certainly, if you if you get a judge like Lord Leggett, and although as of course as Wally and Gretel have said, not all judges are the same in that regard. That my role was to act, as Ollie said, as hopefully an intelligent sounding board, provide my views on the case, research points of law that would feed into the judgment, read the judgment, comment on the judgment, uh, help in any way possible um, Lord Leggett uh, and Lord Hamblin, who wrote the leading lead judgment, to, to, to come to to come and to, to their views, uh, and also um, provide the judgment on a pretty expedited basis. Uh, the other element uh, of, of the work of a judicial assistant that, that I, I saw was the preparation of a press release. You, you may be aware that for, for each Supreme Court and Judicial Committee uh, case, or actually, sorry, not for each Judicial Committee um, case, but for every Supreme Court case, there's a press release that's prepared uh, as part of the court's uh, commitment to public access. Uh, I prepared the, the press release in, in that case, and it sort of involved, and this is a sort of workload point, consolidating 120 page judgment into two and a half pages that's going to be released to journalists. So that's that speaks to some of the sort of work that, 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 that one might be doing. The second case that I want to touch on that, that I was pretty heavily involved in, uh, that certainly from the, the judgment writing stage, the, the hearing happened just at the start of our time at the court, was the Uber case that, that was handed down a few weeks ago. And this is the case, obviously, about whether Uber drivers are workers or not. And I was again involved in sort of road testing and being the intelligent sounding board for the judgment. And I think this really gets to the heart of what the judicial assistant role is. I was sort of tested for want of a better word to think of, you know, where the burden of proof lies, where the alternatives are, what pleading points uh, should and could have been made, what the, the relevant counterfactuals were. And uh, in that case, centered in particular on a sort of purposive interpretation um, of, of statute and, and, um, uh, and the contractual framework in question, really get into the weeds of why this particular framework that Uber had constructed should or should not um, admit to their drivers being being uh, workers. My views on all those issues were solicited by by Lord Legger, who wrote the sole uh, and leading judgment. And I think that that is a testament. I can't emphasize this enough. If you if you want to, you know, reason, uh, research come to a considered conclusion and then sort of get that road tested. This is the this is the place for it. And as Ollie said, and I can't endorse this enough, it's probably the best place to get a, a view of lots of different areas of law in that way because of the range and breadth of cases that, that you're exposed to. Uh, the final thing I wanted to touch on, and I appreciate that I've waffled on for, for, for quite some time already, is uh, things that haven't turned out as I've, I've expected. Uh, I think the one thing that I had anticipated was virtual working, and Gretel's touched on this, but I hadn't anticipated, despite being a pessimist at heart, that we would still be virtual working uh, in April, in, sorry, in March um, 2021. I have sort of adapted, I think, fairly well, like all the other judicial assistants, to the fact that we're not sitting behind the judges, but we're watching the hearings on on um, on the online public stream. But we do, as Gretel has emphasised, try as much as possible to speak amongst the judicial assistants about what we think for, after and during a case. And Lord Leggett and I, much like Ollie said with, with, with him and Lord Burroughs, speak at least sort of twice a week to talk about things that I can be doing, to support his work for future cases or things that that, are, that I can be doing to sort of road test um, and be the intelligent sounding board for judgments. So the, it, it has been different and I thought we would be back in the court by now, but I don't, the one point here that I would emphasize is don't do, don't sort of think now, well, I'm not going to do the role because it's going to be virtual for the next year because you get an incredible amount out of the role. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that it is, um, you know, it's, it is virtual. I'm sitting in in my dining room rather than uh, in the judicial assistance room that that is sort of reserved for judicial assistance on the third floor of the court. The other thing, and I, I will be very brief, uh, is the, the 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 surprised me, and perhaps shouldn't necessarily have surprised me, is the outreach programs. The court conducts a fantastic range of outreach with schools and, and university students, and I've been. Sort of privileged enough to 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 have helped with those, and it's again part of the court's commitment to public access um, and, and transparency. But talking, I, I, it's, it's, it just sounds rather strange. But talking to school children in particular about 
you know, basic concepts or basic legal concepts sort of helps to refine your own thinking or you know it, un unsuspecting um, points that they raise make you think about something more deeply so it's incredibly valuable on a personal level for that respect but it's also valuable to sort of help them see what the supreme court does uh, how it uh, decides cases um and really sort of engage with them on, on recent cases that, that, that we've heard and there were a couple of questions that i just wanted to uh, to, to sort of tackle that i think are still in the um in the in the chat so uh one one was to do with workload and i think this does vary depending on which uh, justice you have i i would say uh, that it's not um it's it's not night certainly my experience has not been that it's nine to five and at five o'clock off you go uh, but again coming from private practice in a, in a city law firm i'm sort of used to to working long hours i think the difference is that what you're you, you're working you know beyond nine to five but you're doing so as Gretel said, you're doing legal research, you're preparing notes, you're engaging your brain constantly. And it's an incredibly, incredibly rewarding experience in that regard. So I, I, I wouldn't say you're nine to, if you're thinking now nine to five, that, you know, anything beyond that sounds like something I don't want to do. It's an incredibly rewarding experience and you, you get swept up in what you're doing, especially when you see the stuff that you've been working on the front page of newspapers as I've had the privilege to do. Um, the, the other question that I think was in the chat was, is there a sort of upper age limit? Um, I don't think I don't think there is. Um, I'm certainly at the older end of the spectrum of people that, that are doing it, given that I've been in practice, private practice for five years before this. Um, but there's there's definitely not an age limit. The real emphasis in the in the interview process is, uh, is on seeing how you think analytically. Um, and, and and also whether you are the sort of person, I think this is a point that Chris uh, made and I would endorse and emphasize wholeheartedly, you are the sort of person that, that could work at the court because the interview process, Chris and the, the, the justices that, that interview you, you know, that is forefront of their mind, figuring out if you're the sort of person um, that could work in this setting. So apologies again, I suspect I've overrun as I often do, um, but happy to take any other questions that people have. Thank you, Oliver, Gretel and Alexander Rowe. Um, there are a few questions um, and if we don't get through all of them, Chris has outlined that he would be happy to communicate with individuals individually in respect to their questions, but there's also an email address on the recruitment website um, um, which you should email your questions to. So the first question I've got here to ask is about um, the application the um, questioner wants to know how the application is assessed, is there a points-based system, and which relevant skills weigh more heavily than others? Uh, well, I'm, I'm happy to take, to take that. Um, I mean, the, to begin with, it's looking at the essential criteria. So if you haven't got a 2-1, then you're not going to get any, any further. There's, there's what we call a crude sift before the first sift, um, and what we're looking for a, re a relevance of examples in the role. So there's no waiting on a particular area as such, but we are looking for examples that are rounded. So um, use, the, use the star system so that we can really understand um, what you've done in the past when you're um, explaining how you meet the competency, explaining what experience you've learned from that. Um, and candidates are ranked, so there is a, there's definitely an element um, of looking at your academic achievements, looking at um, what you have um, achieved so far in your career. Um, Alex is completely right, there is no age limit, and um, PQE um, is useful, um, but it, the, the difference or the difficulty is that what we're trying to do is get the very best legal minds to support the very best legal minds. Um, the justices are um, incredibly, incredibly supportive and nice, but at the same time, they have incredibly high expectations as well. So we're looking for your legal brains above all else and that analytical um, view, the way to get your point across. Uh, somebody in the chat as well asked about um, how, what, what answers should they give or what questions might they get at interview? Um, I, I, can't, I can't reveal that, um, but I, I can say just be prepared with your very best examples. 
um, and be prepared as well to think on your feet um, so that because that's part of part of the role um, and the justices really want to see how you think about legal issues and, and that you can draw out the, the very, the very um, salient points. Um, and as, as we said at the beginning, it, it, even if that's different to them, it's not about being right with them. And they, they really do value with people have got different, sort of different opinions. Um, so I hope, that, I hope that gives an, an answer there. Um, it's not, it's not a, um, the SIFT normally comes around the Easter time and um, I'm heavily involved in, in that, um, as you can imagine. And we will go, th you know, we go through every application form very, very thoroughly and consistently. And it, it, there's another question as well about how do you make your, your examples and your application stand out? And um, again, there isn't a perfect answer to that other than saying that you've got to be true to yourself and, and don't always think of just the obvious examples. Um, I think I've already replied to one of the Q&As. Um, when it comes to that analytical and, and research example, try not to put your dissertation from uni because that's one that lots of people tend to go for. Um, I mean, it, it might be that you did a subject that was so um, original and inspiring that you you can't resist it that's fine and um, but just bear that in mind try to think slightly differently to um, what is the obvious um, because that will that will make your application stand out thank you Chris just briefly because you mentioned the star approach for those of um, our attendees that don't know what that is about could you just give a brief explanation yeah of course um, well it's the situation um, your task and um, action and result. So, so it's just having a more rounded approach, set the, set the scene. And the same, the same applies for the interview as well. Set the scene as to what happened, explain what you had to, to do and, and what, what action you took and then the results. So it's quite, it's quite a simple format, um, but don't be afraid as well of, even if the result wasn't what you expected, as long as you can explain and turn that into a positive. So you shouldn't be afraid of even, even an example where something went terribly wrong. If you learn from it and you can then show that that won't happen again, that's still quite a valuable example. And I think a lot of people only go for the positive examples because they think that anything else is, is going to be seen as detrimental. But if you can explain it in the right way and explain what you took away from it, um, that can work question in the box that I have is whether or not um, you can undertake pro bono work whilst being a judicial assistant. No. <laughs> no while, while you're a judicial assistant, we encourage you to keep in touch with Chambers, but you, you can't take on any, well, you can't take on any private work. Um, I think that there's a limit where we do say to people, if people are, are doing, let's say you're working for an advice centre at the weekends, um, as long as you've got permission, then that would be okay, as long as you're not doing it in the name of a JA. So if you're doing something as an anonymous um, centre where you're offering legal advice on a pro bono basis, that, that can be permissible, but you wouldn't be doing it as a JA or as a, as, as a barrister for your chambers. I, I think that, does that make sense? I don't know if Gretel or Oliver or Alex want to chip in with, it, with that or if you've got any experience of anyone doing any pro bono work? I know there was one JA who at the start of this year still had a pro bono case that was on sort of running on that they'd started already um, and they were allowed to finish that but yeah. again it was exactly like you're saying it was much more to do with in the evenings and at weekends at a free legal advice clinic. Um, in practice Yeah, it would, be, it would be a slight distraction, I feel, from the from the work of the court. And it is only it is only a few months. It's only a nine month role, this one, or a ten month role. Um, there's plenty of time to take on pro bono work um, beforehand and afterwards, which is what I I'm doing at least. Thank you. Um, an interesting question has been asked as to whether or not any of the JAs would be interested in becoming a justice at a later stage in their career. Yeah, I, I mark this one as keen to respond to. <laughs> um, uh, definitely. And 
Um, it's a very good question, actually, because I'd never, so despite having studied four years of law, I'd never really thought about becoming a judge, I guess, because it's not unlike in other countries, a, a career judiciary, really, that you, you have to practice first as a lawyer and then switch into, into it later. But just from the however many months down the line we are now, um, I, I, I'm def I, it's definitely <laughs> um, on my uh uh, on my list of things to consider in future um, and to be honest if you can't be inspired by the Supreme Court justices then then probably you're not going to be inspired to be a judge at all which is totally fine I don't think you ha I don't think you would need to want to become a judge but um, uh, that's just an, another benefit from doing the role. I, I mean I'll, I'll add to that that I know quite a number of former JAs that are doing incredibly well and they will be our future jud judiciary and and I you know I hope I am still around and, and can celebrate when one of them gets appointed as a um, well as a, as a Supreme Court judge for sure but yes we've got some very ambitious people out there and and as I've said you, you each JA um, gains a confidence that I can see, I, I can see it from the difference. And I, I will see it in you, Gretel, when you, when you leave us in July. Um, you get something from the experience and you also get that support network with your colleagues because that, that is also invaluable that you carry forward into your career. And I've, I've lots of former JAs that then still keep in touch. And if they get a case that might come their way, they test out just as they would as JAs. Um, in the real world as well. And they find that that's really invaluable. So not only do you gain a friend as a, as a justice, but you, you, your friendship as, as JAs is, is really something that, that goes, um, well, it just carries forward throughout your career. So I hope, I sincerely hope that we will eventually see former JAs becoming justices. Um, there's something else about, um, I know it hasn't been passed in, in um, as an act yet, but they're talking about increasing the um, the retirement age of the judiciary to 75 from 70. But in some ways, I'm a bit disappointed in that. I'll probably whisper that and I know we're recording it, but um, because I like to think that the higher turnover, at least we know with 70, that um, that gives an opportunity to somebody to, to step up. Um, but that's it's got a way to go. I'll mention one other thing quickly as well, which is just, um, and I apologise to um, Gretel, Alex and, and Oliver um, for rubbing it in, but normally we offer a trip as well to Washington around Easter. Um, and that is quite a fantastic trip to go to the Supreme Court in Washington. Um, it's something that Lord Kerr established many years ago, and we run it as an exchange programme. But for other year groups, it's usually seen as, as something of a highlight and 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 very very um, memorable. I mean, you, it, it's normally an invite into the White House. It's um, yeah, it, it's something special. So I hope that in 2022 that will be um, on offer as well. So I'll just I, add that there. I, I just wanted to add that the JAs this year's group of JAs were planning a no less exciting tour before restrictions were reimposed of the different jurisdictions of the UK. We did plan to go and visit the highest courts in Northern Ireland, Scotland, and we were going to go to, to Wales as well, although of course it's the same jurisdiction. That that plan, as far as I'm aware, and I think Ollie is leading the charge, um, or, or was before restrictions were reimposed, is still hopefully going to happen at some point, but that was our sort of attempt at um, simulating a, a, a JA tour. I think we have time for just one more question, and it's about the allocation of JAs to justices. Is there a set science? <laughs> um, um, sorry, I, sorry, Chris. Well, if you, do you know? Do you know the answer to this one? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I know I, what I, happens. So, <laughs> okay, yeah, go on then. Um, and and really, I mean, this is a, a conversation that I would have with Lord Kerr in usually after and it's a little bit of a mix and match to try and see who um, is the best fit for that particular justice depending on a number of factors and not not just um, legal specialisms but also 
um, for personality and outlook and who's most compatible as best we can. And trying to also see who's some, each justice will use their JA in a slightly different way. So it's also recognizing that different style as well. Usually I would be very diplomatic and, and try and influence Lord Kerr in a, in a very gentle way, um, but leave that decision to him so that he could tell his colleagues who has, he has assigned. Um, so there isn't an exact science, um, but we try to, to match up as best we can. Um, and I think on the whole, let's say getting on for, I think it's nearly a hundred JAs that I've recruited in the time, and on the whole do a pretty good job of, of matching up. And I can't think of any occasions where um, it hasn't worked out or it, it hasn't been successful, a successful pairing. So, but it is not an exact science. Thank you. So um, with that, I would like to say um, thank you so much to our panelists from the Supreme Court team. Uh, and again, if there are any questions that you feel haven't been answered, the email address um, has been placed in the chat box um, and you can send your questions via that email address and um, someone from the Supreme Court team will get back to you. I'd also like to thank everybody for joining us tonight and making the event possible. A huge thank you goes out to the 25 Bedford Road team for allowing us to host this webinar using their Zoom account. And a great big thank you goes to Varuna Asklum for facilitating this for us and entering all this the inf relevant information in the chat box. Thank you all. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.